Lord. We ask that it be spoken with power and authority, Lord, and it would be real to us. Lord, it would be received within our hearts and our minds and our spirit, that we would take it with us, that others may truly know we've been in the presence of the Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Okay, we're continuing on in the kingdom of heaven. So this is the eighth time now, and uh, very important to understand uh, how shall I like in the kingdom of heaven. It's been, you know, many people always trying to seek, like the Pharisees, seek signs, show me what it's going to be like, show me something, and it's no different today, we're doing the same thing, but Jesus made it very simple. For those of you who've been here now over the last uh, eight Sundays or so, now last week we talked about the keys, remember, the five keys, very important, okay, and you have to understand what those are and what they mean, okay, it's not so much having the key, it's how you turn it, it's what you do with it, that's, that's your faith, okay, you find it, all right, and then what you do is you find something very precious, that pearl, that treasure, and the key is you give it to somebody else, okay, you don't deny them of that. Now, you're going to see is this Jesus, he's a master, okay? He's a master teacher, a very wise, wise man. And he came along, he said, how am I going to liken the kingdom of heaven? How am I going to teach you what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like? How am I going to take your mind off of these whimsical ideas of what religion is and what worship is? You know, the, the church and uh, all this gold and silver and all of its, uh, you know, precious jewels and everybody's getting... Uh, you know, walking in in their, you know, three-piece suits and their diamonds, and everyone has to try to look good and or act good, and, you know, and then you got to be careful of that, because what happens is that's one side of the fence, and then you got the other side of the fence. you got the people who just, hey, I just come as I am, but then you think you know it all, okay? Then that's, that's another side of the fence, okay? You'll, you'll point your finger at the person that is in religion and materialism, and, and then you'll, you'll say, well, they're nothing but religious, and look at the way they act and dress, you know, they really think they're self-righteous, but then on the other side, you're over here, and you know, I'm just being me, this is the way Jesus wanted, but then you use the Bible as your own theology, your own weapon, you, it's like your own ter interpretation, it's either your way or your own God, so that's the same difference, it's just you're over here on the other, other side of the fence, okay, and you're too blind to see the difference. Instead of understanding the true uh, principle of how shall I like in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus made it very, very simple for us. Notice how he starts out here. Now, it's going back a ways. He starts out, how shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's what? A man. Okay? A grain. It's like leaven. Now it's like a treasure, and it's like a pearl. Okay? That you find. Okay, it's something, there's a man, that's heaven. See, that isn't enough for most people, okay? Well, how should I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's just like a man. Well, I don't want to see a man. I want to see God. I want to see the throne. I want to see the streets of gold and glass and beauty. No, Jesus said, actually, it's just a man. You, you know why it's just a man? Because you have no concept of what's around you. You see all this beauty, and you don't know what to do with it. You don't know. You don't know how to respect it and appreciate it. It's just a man. But Lord, this is so beautiful. This is so wonderful. We're going to praise you for it. No, you have no clue how beautiful it is. How shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's like a man. It's like a man that has a little grain. Oh, okay. How shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's like a little grain, a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith. It's a man that has that little tiny faith of desire to know me. Well, that doesn't sound too wonderful, does it? And But it's like leaven. It'll start going throughout the world. Now, this is one time when leaven isn't used as evil. So now he has his disciples thinking. Here's God. He's saying, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Now all of a sudden he says, it's this man that has a seed, and this leaven's going throughout the world. This, this understanding is going throughout the world, and he finds a treasure. Oh, okay. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Or it's like a man who finds a pearl. Okay. And what does he do? He sells all he has to buy the field. 
buy the treasure, to, to, to get it, and the pearl. <coughs> so it's actually something he found that is precious. Not the treasure or the, the pearls, it's what he found. Now watch, because listen carefully, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? You're going to see that all of a sudden this person comes along, and listen carefully now as, as we go through this, because you're becoming a Christian, right? You're going out, and you, you find the love of God, and, and it becomes precious to you, and you find it, and you think you bought the field, you think you have the pearl, you think you have it all, and you're going to go out and you're going to tell people about Jesus, because you know what? You have Christ. Well, good for you. You're going to go out and make a difference, aren't you? You think, this is easy enough. All i got to do is go out and talk. That's it. I'll call it preaching. That's what I'll call it. I'll just go out and talk to talk. Sure, I can do that. I can go out and tell people about Christ and about salvation, and, and I can go out and do that. says, but how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? But there's a little bit of a problem because it seems like right here at this point is right where we have put a period in God's plan. Right here is where the church is stuck on stupid, really. <laughs> I just say the sinner's prayer and you're saved. Oh, sure, I can, go in. I can go into the jails and the prisons and, and have a ministry. All I have to do is leave. But I'm done. Oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, I have, a, I have a prison ministry. I go in there and I tell them about Jesus. Then I send them to you. Well, thank you very much. But there's, there's a little bit of a difference. You don't have to deal with the field you bought. You don't have to deal with it. You'll go home and go back to the prison next week. Go in, do your little spiel, talk your talk, and you're done. What, what's really funny is some of you, is, you know what? Some of you, some of you going into those prisons and, and places of that nature can't even help somebody find a place to stay. You lose your job. Talk about putting a period right at the treasure, huh? Oh, I found the treasure. Isn't that sad? Mm -hmm. Some of the ministries go to the jails and the prisons can't even get involved with the individual once they're out of the prison. What kind of ministry is that? What kind of gospel is that? You're going to go in and tell somebody all about the love of Jesus, and then you step out and say, no, I can't have anything to do with you. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? That's why I quit going into the jails and the prison. Because I came to realize real quick what hypocrites are, what two-faced Christians are. I become to realize how somebody can sit there and tell you all about the Bible and their theology and how intelligent they are. You know what? It almost makes me want to puke. It really does. Because look where it has gotten us in 2012. Look where, your, look where your head knowledge of the Bible has gotten you. Just sitting right here. Some of you may not even have a future yet. I'm going to tell you another thing. Every single one of us sitting and standing here today, the Pharisees knew a lot more than we will ever know about the law in the Old Testament. <laughs> They were way more intelligent than we ever will be as Americans. And Jesus came in and condemned them. And said, you better find a pearl. You better know what to do with it. <coughs> Going into prisons. Why would you want to go in there and sit down and tell somebody about Jesus and then get up and say, see you later, bye. It doesn't work well, does it? 
I started going in, and I was saying, well, I can offer you a place to stay. And I started realizing there's so many, I could never fill the bill. I can't keep going. Not yet. It's not time. <coughs> so I would just soon stop than to give false hope. I'm not going to go in, in into somebody's life and tell them all about the love of Jesus when they have nowhere to go and walk away from them. That doesn't even make sense to me. And I'm not going to go in there and say to that person, look, I'm going to tell you about the love of Jesus and I have a place for you. Well, you can't come. There's no room. <clears throat> it also starts painting a little bit of a picture for you about the Good Samaritan. By the way, you walk by him coming really? down here. Did anybody see him? Did you notice him there? Every one of us this morning was a priest and a Levite. He's just a dummy laying there, isn't it? Well, that's just how they thought back then. He's just a dummy laying there. He's a fool. He's a, he's a, he's a no good. We'll just keep walking by. No different than what you walk by. If it caught your attention, that's about what it was then. Just, oh, yeah, that's a dummy laying there. <laughs> where would I where would I go? I'm a priest and Levi. What would I tell him? What could I do for him? Where would I tell him to go? I can't do anything for him. The Samaritan comes along and says, at least I'll bandage him up. And then I'll take him where? <laughs> to an end. I'll take him somewhere. The priest and Levi, why would I stop? Huh? Say a few words, a little prayer there, and see you later. No use in doing that. Hmm? I don't have anywhere to go. Anything? Well, I'll pray for you. See you later. I'll be back next week. <coughs> How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Does that sound like heaven to you? It doesn't sound like heaven to me at all. It sounds like the tears in heaven. It sounds like the hell that is in heaven right here among us. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Matthew 13, 44. As you back up to there, Matthew 13, 44. Notice what Jesus says. Again, I'll tell you, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Now, I want you to notice in Matthew 18, 23, he's going to say, therefore. <coughs> Things are going to change now. All of a sudden, he is going to get into the character of the true Christian. All of a sudden, he's going to come in and he's going to say, now I'm going to show you what the inner man is really like. I'm going to show you what the kingdom of heaven is like within you. Did he not say the kingdom of God is within you? So quit looking for it all around you. Oh, I'm going to go find a good church and serve God. I can't stand that either. Oh, they're in there. They're, they're serving God. I'm going to jump around serving God. What is the kingdom of God is within you? Start fighting for it instead of fighting to get into it. <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, we think we have the ability to walk around and say, uh, oh, yeah, God surely is moving here. Wow. What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> Most of you can't even see God. You're so blind, you don't even know what he looks like. <laughs> Philip even said that. Show us the Father. <laughs> Jesus said, "If you look, I'm right here. You blind Pharisee. We want to be able to go around, yeah, come back for, yeah, God, sure, oh, he was surely moving there. Oh, why is it? You mean you seen him? What did you see? Oh, a bunch of people jumping around. They were doing all kinds of things, all these fake healings and all this stuff. Yeah, gold dust and angels named Emma. You know, all that revival stuff. Yeah, God was moving. <coughs> you a wizard or a prophet or where did he move to? <laughs> Seek signs and wonders. Just humble yourself and find them in your own heart. That's where heaven is. You don't have to go around and explain everything that happened. There's a testimony he gave you. It's in your own heart. Speak about it. Instead of flying angels and gold dust and diamonds in the church pews and people rolling around and speaking in tongues. That's all real people, but it's not what you should be seeking. And it's not what you should be after. And it's not what you should be talking about. You should be talking about the kingdom of heaven within you. How Christ has forgiven you and how he loves you. And how you're ready to give that key to the next person. Period. Amen. Now you're going to see what happens when you don't. 
Matthew 18, verse 23, says, Therefore, he's saying this is true. This is something you need to pay attention to. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Now hold on a minute. Are you with me? He said it's like a man. And he gets a seed. And he has leaven. And now he finds it. But he said don't forget. You are going to have a Lord watching you. How many of you knew that Jesus actually showed you the kingdom of heaven like this? How many of you knew that he actually went through the gospel step by step and showed you exactly what the kingdom of heaven looked like? I'll bet you there isn't one of you in here that can say that. I'll bet you there isn't one of you in here that was ever followed through all these many ways. Jesus said, how can I liken the kingdom of heaven? He showed you exactly what it was like. Because you've been caught up in so much religion and theology that you think it's a bunch of sacraments, it's a bunch of acts, it's a bunch of tithing, it's a bunch of stuff that doesn't even look familiar to Christ when he looks in your heart. Hmm. That's too bad because it's 2012. If it wasn't for this right here, and I'm going to move on because we've got a few more to go in the next Sundays to come, right here, none of us would be here. None of us would be here right now if I would have put a period, I wouldn't even have to preach this. I'd be done. I could go become a Methodist minister. I could go become a CMA minister. I could go become a minister and put a period right there. I found a pearl. I found a treasure. I'm going to tell you all about it. I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> if you need some food, we've got some in the closet. If you need this, we've got a little bit of that. What good is that? Jesus says, look. <laughs> It's like a certain king, a lord, and he's going to take account of his servants. All of a sudden, the attention goes from you finding your pearl and your treasure. It's so wonderful, and you give it all for it, and it's so happy, isn't it? You got the treasure, man. You bought the field. You got the pearl. You got it. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, now you have a Lord over you, and you will give account to what you do with it. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Well, wait a minute, I don't like that too much. They aren't telling me about that. They just said, come and tithe and do what we do. You'll be just fine. No, you've got the eyes of Christ on you right now. And it's going to go a lot with what we talked about last Sunday, that forked tongue, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, that's a bad thing, that forked tongue. Yeah, it sure is. Okay, where are we at here? Verse 24. <clears throat> and we have begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord <laughs> commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. Now, I'm going to tell you, Jesus is coming in saying, so, you want to be in heaven, huh? You really want to be in heaven? Now, do you understand why he said, unless you forsake your mother, father, brother, sister? He says, comes along, he says, listen, so you want the field, huh? You want the pearl. You want to go around and use my name. You want to be a Christian, don't you? Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to expect you to give up every single thing you have. You're going to sell it all. Don't give me what is due to me. I can't do it. You sell your wife, you sell your children, you sell it all to give me what I commanded you to do. How shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? This doesn't sound too wonderful about right now because it's happening every day of your life, and that's just the way it is. And if you want to change it, you can change it. You should listen to these past <coughs> messages coming up to here. 
The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Uh-oh, all of a sudden, here we go. We went out and we got the field, we got the pearl, we got Jesus, and all of a sudden, we're getting preached to. We're getting taught the truth, and we're being told that you better love as I have loved. You better forgive as I have forgiven better do it. You owe me something. And people, it's not works. Oh, no, don't you play the works card. Yeah, because, yeah that's what they do. Double-minded. Good way to get out of conviction is play the works card. Well, you're preaching works. I don't have to know. Your works will follow you. Works won't get you to heaven. I'm going to tell you something. If you truly have Christ as Lord and Savior, they're going to be there. And you can't get away from it. I'm sorry. You know, you have to read that a little closer. Say by faith. Okay, not by works. All they did, they would just put it in order for you. So you don't put works first. It's not saved by works. It doesn't mean that the works aren't going to be there. It means they're there. It's just faith in Christ. The cross alone is what gets you to the kingdom of God. But the works are there. Well, guess what? Jesus is going to start showing you what they are. This is it. How should I like in the kingdom of heaven? Isn't that what you want? <coughs> you be there? Well, if you're not there now, you're not going to be there then. <laughs> God's moving. How many, have you ever heard of, you know, a little <coughs> saying, you know, when you're down and out, I don't feel God's around. Well, remember, God didn't move, you did. Well, wait a minute. You just told me God's moving over. Now you're saying God didn't move. Well, what is it now? So so what is it? Is he this vapor that kind of floats back and forth and drops diamonds every now and then and gold dust or what? What, what is it? <coughs> you just told me God didn't move. I did. Yeah, you move your head too fast. You see things sometimes. You can say, God moved. No, you God did. Moved. You move your head too fast. Oh, the eye. <laughs> oh, got a long ways to go. Now watch. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Very important. Hold on to that. So what? He went and he begged his Lord, saying, Lord, I'm not very good at this. He begged him. And he, he, what did he do? He loosed him. What's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Bound on earth is bound in heaven. And what does he do? He really forgave him. So now, what is the pearl? After you find a pearl, after you find a treasure, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, it's within you. It is forgiveness. No if, ands, or buts about it. <laughs> Now do you understand why at the end of the, the Our Father, God, Jesus says, if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you either. See, it's forgiveness that gives the homeless a place to stay. It's forgiveness that gives you the opportunity to turn the key in somebody's life. You can't go up and be a Christian and try to tell somebody about Jesus if you hold their sin against them. You can't even begin to build family relationships or, or any kind of relationship if you don't forgive the person. That's not heaven. And you can't. You can't put a period right here. This is your next step, people. If you, This is heaven within you. How can you be free? That's bondage to any anything, any unforgiveness in your heart right now is bondage, people. You'll never see heaven with it. Never. You can't go to the cross and accept the cross and beg Jesus for salvation like this. This is what he's saying. You begged me. You, you wanted my compassion, and I gave it to you. How can you try to truly forgive if you don't let the people in your life that need forgiven? How can you truly apply 
the great power of the cross of forgiveness, 1 Corinthians 1.18. If you don't let the inmates and the homeless and, the, and just everybody into your life, how can you ever apply true forgiveness? Oh, I can go to my church and to my little country club and forgive these people because, you know, we, we all put on a big show for Sunday and then I really don't have to deal with them until next week if I want to. And if she looks at me again that way, I'm not going to church next week. And if that preacher does that again, he's not getting my tie. That's not church, people. That's a country club. That isn't what it's about. Boy, we sure can relate to that, can't we? That's why our world is in the condition it's in right now. Now here it is. Now you have to understand this is the wheat and the tares. They must go together. And Jesus, the Bible always teaches itself, and you have to follow it through it. Okay? And listen to what Jesus teaches. And listen to his wisdom and let him show you. And this is what he was trying to do. He was trying to sit his disciples down, his apostles down, and he was trying to get them to look within their heart and see heaven around them in all the people. All the time, not just when you want to, every day. You find a pearl, you find a treasure, you found <laughs> salvation, now it's real in your life. Now you've got to do something about it. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. You don't think you've ever done that? Sure you have. You don't think that you've actually taken people by the throat? Yes, you have. Everybody good for a good argument now and then, aren't you? <laughs> see, that's what you do, see. When you, when you try to get the better side of the argument, you're grabbing that person by the throat. You're trying to stop their mouth. So you go to your Lord. Is that what you want to do? You want to see heaven, do you? You want to see God move? Why don't you look in your own heart and let him move? And when he does move, why don't you let him move some kind words out of your, your throat instead of vomit? You're saved by grace, right? What does grace mean? Wonderful, Wonderful words. words. <coughs> you see some of those... Those movies where those tentacles come out and wrap people around the throat. Some of your tongues are like that. You're going to get the last word. You just strangle that throat. How dare you? I can't forgive you. You don't belong in this church. I don't even want you in my life. I can't forgive you. Get out of here. And you just strangle them. Then what do you do? You always demand something, don't you? You better talk to me the right way. You better tell me you're sorry. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? The Lord said, you came to me and you begged. I didn't ask anything of you. I said, I forgive you. Your debt is paid. What do you do? You go out there, and next person in your life, man, you get whatever it is. People, it doesn't have to be actual money. You could just demand somebody to speak to you a certain way or apologize, somehow make you feel good. It's no different. Did Jesus say that? No, he didn't. The Lord was removed with compassion and loosed him and forgave him. It was done. So you like this heaven stuff? Is this what you really want? Well, you better take a good, close look at the world around you. This Bible is just in your hands. It's just a reminder that this is what you better do. It's a warning is what it is. The Bible is the greatest warning that you ever carry around with you. This Bible wasn't meant for people to go around and uh, come up with their own interpretations on what it should mean, doesn't mean, does mean, what religion it should be, shouldn't be. No, this Bible is a warning in your hands to try to stop you from walking into the fires of hell because of your own darn head knowledge and your own way of thinking. That's what it is.
Then his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. I don't forgive you then. Get away from me. We don't want you here. What did you do? What's bound on earth is bound in heaven. You just closed the prison door on that person. Welcome to hell. And I'll bet you some of you just don't even think that you're in hell or you're going to hell. Don't tell me about it. Read your Bible and do it properly. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Is this you or isn't it? Can you honestly say that? Can you honestly say you don't treat people like this? <coughs> because if you do, welcome to hell. Huh? You're no different than the rich man. Huh? What was he doing? He was in the fires of hell with compassion. He still had compassion. <coughs> Only it was too late. <coughs> Father Abraham, send them back to warn my brothers so they don't come here. Teach my brothers to help the poor. Teach my brothers to forgive. Too late. It's not going to happen. That beggar laid at your gates and begged and begged for forgiveness of his. Just help me remove my debt. No, you're not good at people. Do you realize that the, to be oppressed, to be down on your luck, to be hurt is a debt? <coughs> it's a debt. You go to the Lord and you say, Lord, look what I've done in my life. I'm, in, I'm indebted to you. I, I Look what I've done. He said, So then you turn around and you start judging someone and saying, well, you committed this sin and you're that. Don't come around me. I don't want you here. And that person says in their heart, oh, Lord, why can't they forgive me? And God says, I hear the prayers of the poor and you will be held accountable for them. You know, this heaven uh, isn't a real wonderful place out there in the world like the church has made it out to be. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told under their Lord all that was done. Under their Lord, uh, all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him and said unto him, now listen carefully. Oh, thou wicked servant. People, you need to get your mind off of hell and Hades and the lake of fire. This word wicked, Jesus uses often because he's teaching you what heaven and hell really look like. And you're going to walk with them both. It's the word wicked that you better watch. You know what wicked is? Wicked, to wick, to, to, it's, it's like a venom and a poison, but it's to suck out, to, to oppress somebody, to, to go in and just take their hope away. When, you when somebody isn't forgiven and you want to treat them that way, or you look down your nose at them and you judge them, you're sucking away their worth. But don't remember something, as we talked about, every single human being deserves the kingdom of God as much as you do, and you're no better. You understand that? And if you think any differently, that's wicked. Wicked is hell. What does the Bible tell you? The wicked will become hell. Don't worry about going there. You better worry about becoming it. Because right now in your life, you are either becoming heaven or you are becoming hell. And this is what Jesus is saying. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? How shall I show you what you're becoming? You're either becoming one or the other. I can't make it any simpler than this, uh, people. To throw this in right about now. I think it's fitting. Uh, in talking to an atheist one time, I was talking to him, and he was, uh, uh, I happened to mention that we were having our bus in the parade. He said, oh, so you're a Christian. I said, yes, I am. He goes, I don't believe in God. I said, oh, you don't? He said, no. He said, I, and we were outside of the yard. So he said, oh, yeah, all this just happened. And I said, well, I said, I like to read the Bible because Jesus is a very wise man, and I like to read it. Well, this, this big bang theory happened, and 
this all happened, there can't be a God. And I said, well, Jesus is a wise man, so I like reading the Bible. And I said uh, to him, I said, well, what, what, uh, what happens to you, though, when you die? And he goes, just go on the ground, it's over, it's done. I said, oh, I, that's interesting. I said, I like reading the Bible because Jesus is a very wise man. I like his teachings. I think he's very smart, you know. And he went on to say some other things about the creation and all this happened. And I, I said, well, that's why I like the Bible, you know, and I like he's a very smart man. And uh, I said, well, so what about Einstein? I said, do you, do you believe in Einstein? Yeah, he was smart. And uh, I could tell by talking to this guy, he's full of head knowledge. Garbage. So I said, well, then, if you believe in Einstein, do you believe in his theory that energy never ceases to exist? You know, and he continues on. Well, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and I said, oh. I said, then, if that's the case, I said, that's why I read the Bible. Because Jesus is a very wise man, and I like to get you know, to the truth of things. And I said, so then it's a proof of fact that your body's energy. Yeah, I can agree with that. I said, so, if your body's energy, and you understand that, if you go on the ground, where's your energy go? <laughs> it has to go somewhere, right? Well, yeah, I never thought of that. I said, well, see, that's why I read the Bible. Jesus was a very wise man. He was simply teaching you this. You're either going to become positive energy, which is heaven, or you're going to become negative energy, which is hell. Now, pick. Which one would you like to become? Nobody ever told me it quite like that before. I said, well, think about it. Because Jesus is a very wise man. And this is what he's teaching you. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? You're either going to become heaven or you're going to become hell. You're either going to be wicked or you're going to be like him. That's your choice. Now, you look in your own heart. He said, you look inside. You're a man. I've given you a seed of faith and the ability to be as leaven to go out and show that. You found a pearl, you found a treasure. You're willing to grasp it. Now the hardest part is going to start. Now you want to follow me through heaven, huh? See, now do you understand why Peter was asked three times, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Peter didn't grab the treasure yet, did he? No, he didn't. He's saying, Peter, you're going to love me as soon as you claim that treasure. As soon as you give it all for me, Peter, and you find yourself walking where you don't want to walk, doing what you don't want to do, then you will know that you love me. Then you will know you are in heaven. That's why we just go to sleep, people. I'm going to tell you something right now. The church, instead of waiting to go to heaven, people, you're in it. Look within your heart. You're in it, and the world needs you. These people need you in earth as it is in heaven. Why do you think Abraham is holding the beggar in his arms right now? In earth as it is in heaven. Waiting the great white throne judgment. Waiting that moment. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? you remember the Bible tells us that Jesus became pity for us? That's, that's what he looked like on the cross, when he went to the cross. He became pity. And he said, you couldn't even have pity like I had for you. I was beaten down and died on that cross to forgive you and love you, and you couldn't even show that pity <laughs> that forgiveness to everyone I put in your life. You don't want heaven. You want hell. And you're going to become whatever you choose. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Wait a minute. That darn word, everyone, is in there, isn't it? Everyone. Can, can you say that? Everyone. That was, that was, that was, that was Say it again. Everyone. 
I think we've got to do it one more time. Everyone! People, that's heaven. That starts right now. That's what's wrong with our world today. I'm going to tell you right now, if the Christians would stand up in the churches for these homeless and, the, and, the, and the, the inmates out there, stand up in the true love of God, you won't have to worry about sending them away. They're not going to want anything to do with it. The ones that don't want God, the ones that don't want rehabilitated, the ones that do not truly, sincerely want that divine movement of God that everyone's looking for. You want to see a movement of God, you see a movement of God when somebody stands up and says, I've accepted Jesus Christ, now I'm going to go out and live it. That's a movement of God. There, I'm moving. You see? You get it? God's within me and I'm moving. There's a movement of God. You're a movement of God. You're a movement of God. You are, you are, you are. I don't need some angel and some dust and some wind blowing through the whole oh, the trees blew, the Holy Spirit moved through. Get up and run around. There's the Holy Spirit move. Amen. 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 I mean, come on, people. That's what it's about. The kingdom of heaven's within you. And you still got to start respecting that and honoring that. The kingdom of heaven is within you in a simple word. This is the beginning now. We're not done yet. We've got a few more Sundays to go. It started with forgiveness. You can't even move for God. You can't even live for Christ without forgiveness. It has to be number one. As soon as you find that cross, that moment is forgiveness, and it better stick. Some of you say, well, I can't forgive. Oh, yes, you can. Because if you say can't forgive, you're blas blasphemy. That's saying that the Holy Ghost is not within you. The Holy Ghost can do anything. You don't ever tell the Holy Ghost it can't do anything. That's blasphemy. It doesn't mean you have to like it. It doesn't mean you have to accept it. It means you've forgiven it. It means you have acknowledged in the eyes of God that person is innocent just like you. It doesn't mean you're going to like it. It means in the eyes of God, you know in your heart that that person deserves heaven as much as you do. It, that person deserves forgiveness no matter how bad they hurt you. They're forgiven in the eyes of God. <laughs> See, that's why Jesus said the cross, it is finished. A lot of you have unfinished business in your past. Get it finished or you cannot walk in heaven. You can't <laughs> walk in heaven with unfinished business. And any unfinished business you have in your past is hidden landmines in your battlefield. And as you go walking in your, you can't have a good future until you finish that business. Because any unfinished business you have is a hidden landmine in your future, and you're going to hit it. I guarantee it. So what you've got to do is you get rid of it right now. That means you call on Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, and you ask for that forgiveness right now. Just what he's saying. You go to him and beg him. You tell him you're not worthy. You tell him you are in debt to him. You tell him that there isn't anything you can do. And you hear those words of con compassion. Child, I forgive you. Now go and do the same. Now do you understand he's coming up to the great white throne judgment? Isn't that where we're heading? He's going to lead us right to the throne of God, people. By the way, some of you have been in the Bible studies. Some of you know this is exactly what he's doing. Sit down and study it. We're in number eight of this. He's moving you right through the outer court, right through the holy place, right up to the throne of God. There's God moving. Do you understand that? And it's in you. He said you are the temple, and he's moving you right through that temple to the throne of God. You don't need to see any whimsical things that man tries to subliminally impregnate into your mind so that you can go around and think that you're experiencing God. You want to experience God? You let some homeless or somebody from the outside come in that you don't really know. That's going to challenge all your instincts. I've been doing this for 12 years, people. I've never said no to anyone. You don't think in the back of my heart and my and faith, I'm saying to God, I have no idea who's coming into my home. That's faith. That means forgiveness. I don't care because I said in my heart and mind, they're forgiven. They have the same right to you as I have. And how am I, how could I ever say differently? It doesn't mean I don't question. You should, you should Steve, the first guest out of Hell's Angels. He go, I thought I was done. <laughs> One of the nicest fellows I ever met. <laughs> it's hot up here. I gotta get this on. Well, smite. Yeah, you love it. 
Luke 13. Let's go there. I want. I do want to get make a little bit of a point here for you. Life. <coughs> so a couple things here. Luke 13, verse 28. <coughs> there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are the first which shall be last. I'm just trying to paint this picture to you. See how Jesus is bringing you through the temple. He's getting you to the throne of God. He's saying to them, you are going to be without. Right before the great white throne judgment, you Pharisees, they're going to acknowledge that. Very intelligent men, if they don't accept him, accept his, his love. He, that's why he said, listen to what they say, just don't do what they do. They don't want to do it. They're casting out the Samaritans. They don't want to take that step that they should. He's saying because of that, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. Now remember, the kingdom of God is subject, is not subject to the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven is always subject to the kingdom of God. That's why. Why do you think the Bible, why does God have to make a new heaven? And a new earth, a new heaven, because we've defiled it. See, we're walking in it. This is heaven, the second heaven. Remember, Paul went to the third heaven. So he's going to say, you're going to stand there. You're going to look past the curtain. You're going to see all your law, what you know, all that, because they were very intelligent. The Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees, you're going to see that, and you will not enter. But who will enter? You're going to see the publicans and the harlots, the sinners going in, and you're going to be thrust out. Why? Because, yeah, you heard me, Nicodemus, you wanted the field, you wanted the pearl, but you wouldn't live it. Remember the, the uh, adulterous woman thrown down at the feet of Jesus? They come to Jesus, didn't they? Challenged him. He forgave. What did they do? Walk away. They put a period right there at the field. They put a period at the pearl. You know, how many of those Pharisees, how many of those do you think in their mind really thought, you know what? He very well is the Messiah. He is a powerful man. But they would not take that step <coughs> of forgiveness. They were right there. No different than a lot of our church leaders today. How many? Why do you think Nicodemus come out at night? See, he was there. He wanted to take that step into forgiveness. He wanted to forgive all people. You see, what do you think happened to that thief on the cross? When he died on the cross, he looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, you have done nothing wrong. That was his forgiveness. Remember me today in paradise. You know what he's saying to him? You're already there. It's within you. You found it. You were able to look at Jesus. That's what salvation is, people. This is what salvation is. It's looking at this man and knowing that what he did, what he lived for, what he taught is what the world needs. But we will never be able to do it alone. That's faith. You're not looking at a, a, a cross and a man on a cross. You're looking at what he stood for. Colossians, he nailed it to the cross. That the love of this man is what the world needs. And we can't do it alone. We've got to do it together. What are we looking at? This. And then we're putting our own religions here. We're putting our own ideas. And we have no clue what's here. Remember I've told you this how many times. This is a pagan symbol. We don't know if this ever stood on Calvary. You don't know if a kataw, this cross, ever stood there. It could have been a tree. It could have been a pole, the Bible says. You don't know. But how many churches have this hanging on their walls? This you know happened. This is truth. You know this took place. You never pray to this. This is a piece of plastic. I use this to show you and teach you. That's it. You don't pray. This thing can't do anything to you, for you or to you. But in your mind, in your heart, what it, this, this whole life, you just don't break it down. You've got to have the birth, the whole thing, the prophecy, the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection, all one. But this moment was forgiveness and love. This moment was a moment that should be in your heart, mind, and soul. You were there, people. You were there like the Apostle John. The same Holy Ghost that was with him is with you. You were there. 
And this is what Jesus became pity for you. He forgave you. And this is what Jesus is saying. How dare you? Go ahead and come to me. Understand that. Want my forgiveness. And then you treat each other like hell. If that's what you want, that's what you will become. We'll never be perfect at it, people. But it's something we should always desire and strive for. Luke 16, 23. talked about this for you. Sixteen twenty three, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. What did he say that he was going to do to the wicked servant? Give him over to the tormentors. Now here's the rich man who had a beggar laying outside his gate. What was the only reason why that rich man would not bring that beggar in and help him? Hmm? Any idea why? Think about it. He wouldn't forgive him. He wouldn't accept him for who he was. He held, it, he held things against him. He didn't look a certain way, dress a certain way, wasn't a certain nationality person. You know, he didn't want him to forgive who he was. People, I don't care if the, if the person is an atheist. I don't care if they're a witch or a wicca. You forgive them. They're forgiven. They deserve the same right that you have to God. They might be walking in hell right then, but that's not your uh, 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 opinion to judge. You give them your key. What does that mean? You turn the key in your life. You share Christ with them. That's what you do. Now, that's the simple gospel, bearing fruit. <coughs> That's what you do to somebody who is a non-believer. You don't use it against them. Well, you're going to hell because you're a witch or a wicca. You know? You be that. You forgive them for who they are and what they've done. And you set that example. If they want to come into your life, you let them come into your life. This idea from, uh, the, uh, you know, separate yourself from among them. Oh, man, that's a whole other sermon. That isn't anything what you're thinking right now. You're not God, so don't act like God. You don't tell God who should be near you and who shouldn't. As a Christian, you love and forgive all people. How shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's like a certain king, a lord, is now in charge of you. A lot of you have Jesus as your savior, but not lord. He's lord now, and his eyes are on you. Now watch what happens here. 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He's holding Lazarus. Notice, this man looks up and he does not see God, does he? He does not see Jesus, does he? He sees the beggar in the arms of Abraham. What does he see? He sees someone being comforted while he's being tormented. When he always had it, man, see? See, the thing is, is he thought he was in heaven. Remember, he said, Father Abraham, very religious person. Here, all his life, he thought he had it made. He was religious and he was in heaven. Now he finds himself in hell. And this beggar, who is literally in hell because of the rich man, now finds himself where? In heaven, because the first will be last and the last will be first. His torment is ending and the rich man is just beginning. Now, I want you to notice something here. The Bible says torment translates into torture. All right, you'll hear some people say, well, torture isn't in the Bible. Translation-wise, it is. But the thing is, you have to understand there, is the devil and all of his demons have no, no right nor privilege to torture anyone. They're being tortured themselves. But this torture and torment is going to be becoming what you have chosen to be. If you want it to be greed, so be it. That will be your hell, and you will live that hell. Because you did not loose, okay, the bondage of your unforgiveness. You can't even begin now to walk in the kingdom of heaven without stopping right here and seeing, yes, I accepted Christ. Yes, I accepted the pearl. Now I need forgiveness for all. How do you know that's happening? Well, you're going to know it throughout this week. You're going to know it how you look at people, talk to people, etc. Let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, verse 4. Second Kings four. <clears throat> Second 
2 Kings 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wise of the son of the prophets of Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So, so see, Jesus was a master, very wise. Now, now we're dealing with Elijah, okay, the prophet. And here the same principles in effect. Jesus takes that same, remember the same, is it's always the same, takes that same teaching and principle and he's bringing it into how shall I like in the kingdom of heaven. You've got to understand, these prophets of old, all right, that's who they were. They were literally heaven among them, the prophets of old, the major, minor prophets. See, so the, the, and the Pharisees, the Holy Ghost was on the outside, see, of the priests and so on. Remember? So when the prophets come, that was heaven among them. That was it. They were bringing the teaching and, and so on. Okay? So here it is. Same principle. Now Jesus comes and says, now the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you. All right? Now we get all our priests. We all have that within us. So here's the difference you've got to understand here. Same principle. Now watch. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? How many times have you heard Jesus say that, huh? What do you want from me? What, what is it that you want? Okay, so here is that the kingdom of heaven is being used through the great prophets. Now Jesus is coming along and saying, Now it's within you. And he's teaching that to them. So what does he say? What is Jesus says, What is it that I can do for you? And Jesus is teaching them, It's within you. It's what you're going to do for them. Okay? So here's that teaching. Now, the new covenant is taking... Okay, look, what, tell me, what has thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid has not anything in the house save a pot of oil. All I have is a little pot of oil. That's it to, to Elijah. That's all I got. How can I ever pay my debt? See, we go to the Lord. I, I don't have anything. How can I ever pay it? Then he said, listen carefully, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Love thy neighbor as you love thyself. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and opened her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live. <laughs> Thou and thy children of the rest. Wow, what a message there. Oh, come on, man. I hope you hear this. off those streets and out there, even out of religion, you should be learning. You're going to Jesus. You're saying, Jesus, how do I pay this debt? I don't have anything to give. And Jesus said, Jar of oil. We'll see. So I'm going to tell you what. You get into the church and you go to them and you ask them for oil. Even if the jar is empty. Even if they don't have anything to give you, you take their jar. You get encouraged. And pretty soon, you're going to find that you're going to have enough 
of the anointing oil of my love and forgiveness that the church is going to make you feel that there is a future, there is a hope, and you found it in Christ. And you will find that you are full and the debt is paid, and now you have a future and go with it. Why? Because my church came together and become neighbors, and they knew what they were doing. And no matter where you've been or what you've done, they forgave you. And I acknowledge that as the oil, the anointing oil from the olive tree. You just passed on the olive tree. See, people, now, now hold on to that. I hope you understand that because, see, this is where you are in the kingdom of heaven. This is exactly where you are, where you go and you say, Lord, here, take this debt from me. But, people, if you do that and you turn around and there's nobody there to help you, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and you're going to grab somebody by the neck and demand. But when you can turn around and you see that there's people that care about you, that they're right in there with you, you have no reason to do that. That's why you're a body of Christ and you need to do that together. You must understand that. You must understand this principle, people. You have to understand just how important this teaching is and the new covenant is. Without me going into all of it. Look, some of you may know this from the teaching. And if you aren't constantly repeating everything uh, and bringing it back, then you're not preaching the gospel. You're teaching your own philosophies, your own three-point sermons. That's, that's false as far as I'm concerned. You've got to always be tying it together. Always got to be. The Bible is all one. You've got to be pulling it together. And it always has to make sense and it has to line up both Old Gospel, Old Testament, and the epistles. Okay? The whole life of Christ. Now, what did Elisha say? Go to the neighbors. Whether empty or not, get the vessels. The oil will be there. Why? It didn't have to be physical oil, people. It was because they worked together. That was paid. People think, you know what? We think that salvation, it is a personal relationship with Christ. But we have taken it that it's that personal that it's all about me and no one else. No, that's hell. That's why Jesus said, how are you going to escape the damnation of hell if you can't do it for another as I've done for you. See, self righteous says, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and you know what? All i got to do is read my Bible, and I'm done. If I help the poor, that's fine. I don't have to. It's all about, well, you know what? You just might open up your eyes, and you might see Abraham holding that beggar, and you're going to realize, what have I done? I missed something. I missed something very important. Now, I could go in, and we're going to. Now, you have to listen. You have to stay with me. Now, I'm going to end. The ten virgins. Remember the ten virgins? Five of them made a big mistake, didn't they? They didn't have enough oil. Okay? Now, listen. I'm going to end here, but we've got to hold all this together as we go later. Now, listen. Gehenna. All right. You know what Gehenna means? An oil press. Jesus was in the garden. What, what was the oil press? What it was, it was like a big stone, okay? And it, and it was indented, okay? Like a, like a little crater. And they would put all the olives in there. And then they would take a big stone and set on it, and it would crush. And as it would crush, see, the olive oil would pour out the sides. And one thing, the women, they would go there and get that oil then as it was crushing out to fill the lamps up, you know, to keep light. And that's where they would go, all right? Well, Gehenna is the crushing down of the oil, the anointing oil. Now, when you go back to the root of David, okay, the root of David, the oil, the olive branches, etc. we can go there and the study and so on. Uh, when that's happening, that crushing down, well, where did Jesus go? He went into the garden of Gethsemane. Did I say Gehenna before? Okay, I'm sorry. It was, it, yeah, Gethsemane, okay? Oh. <laughs> and the, the crushing down. So that means to press. Jesus goes into the garden, and what happens? He's being crushed. 
see, Christ is being crushed. He starts weeping. What starts pouring out of him? Blood. Salvation. The oil. The anointing of the New Testament. Why do you think the, the bleeding woman touched his hem? See, the oil. She went to the neighbor. She went to her neighbor, to Jesus, and touched. What do you think the Good Samaritan? You're vessels of oil. And you must help each other. One vessel alone is useless. You must understand that. And Jesus was that pressed. That's why he was pressed down and pressed down and pressed down. And all of us that go to that moment of pity and compassion, then we get that oil. And he says, you're forgiven. Your debt is paid. Now go and experience someone else's pain and be ready to give them the oil. Well, maybe if yours is empty or full, it doesn't matter. Sometimes our oil gets, gets a little bit empty. We've got to go back to Jesus. That's okay. Sometimes people come to me. I'm so drained, you know. I'm down to no oil left. And you keep going. And you go back to Christ. And you fill that oil up again. It doesn't matter, though, whether it's empty or it's not empty or half full. It doesn't matter. Jesus said, you're doing it for one reason. Because you forgive each other. And you love each other just the way you are. And don't ever forget that. Now we can begin to walk closer to the kingdom of God. Are you with me? Amen. All right? Now you can begin to move. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is your way of drawing near to God, people. This is walking with Jesus now. That's why Jesus said, follow me, I'll show you. Everybody, you want to go and walk with God. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You want to take a walk with God. You remember Moses? Moses was still in good health. Moses could still see. Moses could still talk. Moses was disobedient. Moses got a little bit prideful. And what did God say? Come on, let's go take a little bit of a walk. Didn't he, Moses? Let's take a walk. Only one person came back, and that was God. He said, Moses, you disobey me. You're dead. That's it. That's how God walks. You want to walk with God? I'm going to tell you, if any one of us took a walk with God, now we wouldn't come back. This religious stuff. I want to go and walk with God, do you? You want to be in the center of God's will? Well, you got to be dead, people. You can't be in the center of God's will. You got to be dead to be there. Walk with Jesus. That's what he says. How shall I like it? Came heaven. Come on. <clears throat> Let's walk through it. You're a man. You have a seed. Your leaven's starting to go out. Here's your pearl and treasure. Take it. Take it. Yeah, I'm going to take it. I got it. I'll give everything I have for it. And Jesus says, now stop. Now you've got a Lord. And that's me. You ready to go next week? Now we're going to be walking closer and closer to God. But Jesus steps in and says, now I'm going to show you what to do now that you are saved where the world is put a period right here and has not moved any further. Well, it's time to move further. And you can read the rest of that in Matthew 25. And as much as you do to the least of these, you've done it to me. That's sharing your oil, people. Receive that healing oil from God. It's true forgiveness. Continue to walk in heaven. Let me get up out of your seat here in a couple minutes. Look around. You're in heaven. You don't have to look at the beauty of the trees and everything. That's creation. You look at everybody around you, and you're seeing heaven. You're seeing God moving. All in our own individual ways. But every single one of us that has Christ, there's one thing that we have in common with the cross. It's called forgiveness. And it's the same in every one of us. Look for that in everyone all the time, and you'll be in heaven. And the moment you open up your eyes, you won't see Abraham. You're going to see your Lord. You know what you're going to see? Forgiveness and mercy. It's here right now. Let us pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you for forgiving us. And Lord, help us to know that we can look within ourselves and we can see heaven right now. We can sense it. We can feel it by faith in your love and forgiveness. Lord, if there's anybody we've been judging or maybe we can't forgive in our lives, Lord, let us finish that business right here, right now, so that we can truly have all of heaven and all of you.
so that our, our oil jars can begin to fill up so that we're ready when the next person comes to show them that we truly do forgive them, that we may pass our oil on, that they may see you are real, you are alive, and they can see their debt is paid by the cross. We thank you so much for the cross. We thank you for becoming pity for us. We thank you for loving us just the way we are. Lord, help us get our eyes off of material things and whimsical things and, and religiosity, Lord, and help us to look within our hearts and experience forgiveness and mercy and love in a way we've never had before. Let us feel it when we walk. Feel it when we talk to each other. Let us feel it when we fellowship. Let us feel it when we're out at work or in the community. Let us feel a forgiveness for everyone that we've never had before. Bless us with that joy and happiness. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.